Our particular uh, closing speaker, uh, I think, is uh, almost doesn't need an introduction, uh, but uh, I'll give one anyways. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Michael Goodchild, uh, I think clearly a distinguished uh, representative of the academic community with respect to just about everything uh, to do with geospatial information. Uh, he has a PhD from uh, McMaster University uh, in Canada. Uh, he has been uh, a professor of geography uh, at the University of California, Santa Barbara, since I think 1998. Uh, he has uh, published something like, um, I think, more than a dozen books and something around 350 scientific papers. Uh, so that's a, a pretty significant uh, accomplishment. Uh, one of the big items that has been talked back and forth in this meeting and will be talked back and forth probably for the, the duration of the rest of our lives uh, is how uh, geographic data acquisition should take place to help us build this geo web, uh, whether we should uh, you know, look at the world only from space and, or from, from airplanes or whether we should build it all from the ground up. And uh, uh, Dr. Goodchild is going to address that issue. So thank you. Uh, thanks, Ron. It's a great pleasure to be here. It's always a pleasure to come back to Canada, and particularly Vancouver. Um, let me just give you a couple of caveats before I start. Um, number one, I think what I'm going to be talking about is a very controversial issue, and it will remain that way for a long period of time. Uh, I'm going to be presenting very much a U.S. perspective, and I'm aware that the Canadian situation is substantially different, and I expect some disagreement as these issues cross backwards and forwards across the border. Um, so these are some of the things you might want to pick up um, at the end in the discussion. Um, what I'm going to do is to present then my viewpoint and, and some of the issues that have occurred to me and that I'm actively researching and that fascinate me as we move forward in the geospatial community. And as um, Ron said, um, this is uh, very much on everybody's mind. It's the question of whether geographic information acquisition should in future be top down or bottom up or some mixture of the two. Um, I think a good place to start is here with this question to which almost all of us of course know the answer, which is the question of how geographic information gets created. And traditionally of course the answer has been by authorities and by their experts. And whether we're talking about Canada and the national mapping agencies here who produce the bulk of geographic data or the USGS in the United States, or the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, or in the UK, the Ordnance Survey, uh, many other countries where national mapping is still primarily a military uh, function, and access by the civilian sector is severely restricted. Um, and increasingly, certainly in the US, uh, increasing geographic information production by state and local governments, and in Canada, of course, by, by the provinces. Um, it, it is then disseminated to a collection of users, increasingly a vast collection of users, many of whom are non-expert. So here's a distinction immediately between the potentially non-expert user and the expert producer. And much of this dissemination occurs with various kinds of restrictions. So countries and governments will vary depending on whether distribution is at the cost of reproduction or tries to recover some of the cost of production. And certainly since 9-11 in the United States, there's been a major shift, not only in access to data, many data sets were removed from public access after 9-11, but also in a general shift from the USGS, the Civilian Mapping Agency, to the NGA, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, the, the Department of Defense Mapping Agency. And much of our spatial data has now moved be, behind that national, national security curtain. Let me start with, with one particular kind of geospatial data, which is the names layer. As Ron said, this is clearly one of the types of geographic data which is not going to be derived from space. Until people put barcodes on the tops of their buildings, you're not going to be able to get place names from space. So where do place names come from? And they come through a formal process, which in every country is reflected by a hierarchy of boards and committees. In the United States since 1890, it's been the Board on Geographic Names, which sits at the top of a hierarchy all the way down through the state level, down to the local level, all of it run by experts, no role for amateurs, no role for the general public. 
This is how names get officially recognized. And the term gazetteer, in fact, reflects that official recognition. When something is gazetteered, it is published officially. And the, the name for the index of, of, of place names essentially reflects that. All of this was driven by a need to standardize. A lot of the effort in the 19th century was concerned with postal delivery. It was also done in, in a way to avoid uh, names on the landscape which were politically incorrect or um, colorful in different ways. And it has been a process which has been operating now for well over 100 years. Now, contrast that with this. This is a map made in saint dié de vosges a small town in France, in eastern France, in 1507. It was made by Martin Waldseemuller under the direction of Vautrin Lut. And Waldseemuller was making a new map of the world. And he needed to put a name on this vast area of land which was being called the New World, which had initially been discovered by Columbus and later explored by others. And he picked on the name America. And he did so because he at the time was convinced, as a result of letters that he'd received from Florence, that it was Amerigo Vespucci who was the first person to recognize that all of this new land was a new continent. Columbus, he was convinced, was still thinking that what he was looking at was the eastern extension of the Indies, that he really visited China, except that he'd landed on one of the outlying islands. It was only Vespucci who really realized this was a new continent. So he took Vespucci's first name, Amerigo, feminized it to America because he thought every continent should have a female name, and stuck it on the map. And the map was distributed across Europe, and the name stuck. And that is literally why I come from the United States of America, and not the United States of something else, such as the United States of Colombia. Waltz Miller had no authority whatever to do this. He had no training as a cartographer, as a geographer, Nobody had officially recognized him. He stuck a name on a map. And I just want to draw this out because I think there is a parallel here to what is happening currently. This was the era before standardization in the naming process. We are now, I think, entering an era post-standardization in which IT makes it perfectly possible for places to have alternative names. Names don't have to be standardized and allows us to collect a vast amount of information well beyond simple names. And that's the world we're moving into. It's the web, world of Web 2.0, and it's the world of bottom-up geographic data production. So in a sense, there's an echo here of 501 years ago. Uh, Waltz Miller later regretted what he had done. And in a later map produced some years later, he removed the name America and returned, returned it to terra incognita because by that point he'd been convinced that Amerigo Vespucci's claims weren't actually authentic and he hadn't really done what he claimed to have done. So this opens up then a world which I, I call the world of volunteer geographic information, emphasizing the fact that it's geographic information and that it's being volunteered by citizens. Now there are a number of aliases, a number of alternative terms here which is worth just reviewing. This is really a phenomenon of the 21st century an echo of the, the 16th century. User-generated content is what we're talking about, but user-generated content in the specific context of geographic information. Collective intelligence, the term we apply to the process by which large numbers of people contributing to the same information will eventually converge on the truth. So place names contributed by a large population hopefully will allow people to edit each other and will eventually converge on the truth. Crowdsourcing is another term for basically the same thing. This is what you might call asserted information in the sense that it's asserted by individuals rather than authoritative information which comes from the national mapping agencies. So what I'm going to be talking about you can think of as, as a tension between authoritative and assertive information. What it really represents though is the empowerment of millions of private citizens. Largely untrained, no obvious reward for what they're doing, why do they do it? Sitting up late at night, working away on their computer to create geographic information. What makes them do it? Very important question. Maybe. No guarantee that what they're doing is the truth. No authority whatever to do so. And yet what they're doing is prolific. And I think it's interesting. So that's the topic I want to explore. And let me